Welcome everybody uh, to this Rec Code Manager webinar, um, which is going to talk you through the process for accessing the gas, uh, gas inquiry service and electricity inquiry service under Rec version 3, including some of the changes that will apply um, compared to today. And also talk you through how to access the new retail energy location in those systems. We'll also touch a little bit on the changes to accessing the API within the systems as well, uh, tackling some questions that we've received in advance of the session. Uh, before we get going, um, just wanted to let you know who is going to be speaking to you today and talking you through the agenda items. I'm not going to speak for long. I'm just here really to steer the, the day along. Uh, my name is Paul Rock. I work for the Rec Code Manager as the head of communications. And if, if you've been to a Rec event before, you you've, you've probably know know about me by now. Uh, but the real experts are the, the people um, that are below me and, and alongside me on the screen there. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, Ash, Ashley McGlave, um, who works for the uh, Electricity Inquiry Service Service Provider in a business operations role. We'll be hearing from Andrew Wallace at RECO, who's the Switching Program Implementation Manager. Christina Bermudez Alvarez, who works for the RECO Manager within the Party Assurance Team as Party Assurance Manager. Andrew Steed, who works for the Gas Inquiry Service Service Provider as a business analyst, and he'll be providing the, the demo of the Gas Inquiry Service. And Anne Perry from the Change Team within the Rec Code Manager in her role as the Change Delivery Manager. Before we do get going, just a small bit of housekeeping before we start. Given the numbers of people we have on the call today, I am asking if you could keep your cameras uh, and your microphones switched off. Uh, it may be that after you've asked a question and I'll talk you through how to raise your questions, that we might ask you to switch your microphone back on just to, to, to elaborate on a, on a question um, if that might be needed. But and, and we'll certainly ask our presenters to keep their cameras and their microphones on. It would be quite useless if they didn't. Um, but 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 in all other purposes, if you could keep your cameras and microphones switched off just so we can make things as smooth as possible that would be great. Uh, I mentioned how the event is being recorded today so for those who weren't able to access today's session um, and, and I know that this was originally meant to happen uh, last Monday we, we rescheduled to today so there might be a few people who had registered but weren't able to make the revised date. So my ambition is that by hopefully the end of Wednesday I'll be able to uh, complete the edit of the recording and publish on the portal on the rec portal and on our um, YouTube channel as well um, for you to share with any colleagues who, who would benefit from accessing the information. We're using our um, audience engagement tool called Slido um, to allow you to ask us questions throughout the event um, and get answers from our, our, our expert uh, presenters and also to leave feedback at the event and let us know how we uh, how, how it went, uh, what we done well and what we could do better. Um, and I'll talk to you in just a very a brief second about how to access Slido. Uh, but there are also opportunities through Q&A throughout the session. We don't need you to hold all your questions to the end. After every speaker, um, we'll have a look at any questions that have come through Slido um, and see whether they can be answered as we go. All right. In terms of Slido, uh, this is how you do access Slido. Um, if you can, uh, either on a different window of your browser or on a mobile device, if you can access slido.com, and enter the code 4395996. Then it will present you with a space to allow you to ask questions, type out your questions. And you're also, once people have put questions on there, you'll be able to upvote other um, colleagues' questions so, uh, so that the most relevant, the, the questions that are most pertinent to you rise to the top and can be prioritised to be answered by our speakers um, as we proceed through the day. There's a QR code there you can see as well. Um, so if you've got a, a, a mobile device, if you scan that with your camera, that will take you straight into the, uh, the Slido space. You won't even need to enter the code. You'll be straight into our, our Slido workspace for today's event as well. I'll leave that on screen just for a couple of seconds while people are uh, navigating to it to make sure you're all able to access it. As I said, um, if while we're fielding the questions later on, um, there are sort of um, questions that we want to elaborate on, um, we'll invite the, the, the originator of the question maybe to unmute themselves and, uh, and just provide more detail if and when that becomes relevant. Um, and once we get to the parts of Q&A as well, just in case you haven't been able to navigate to the website yet, we'll put the code back up on the screen as well to give you the opportunity uh, to get there at the right time. All right, 
also the code is in the chat as well in case you you missed it and here's the agenda for today after i've finally done talking um, I'll pass over to Christina and Christina is going to talk us through the changes to the process um, for uh, applying to and getting access to the gas inquiry service. Um, then Andrew Wallace at RECO is going to talk you through the same process, but for the electricity inquiry service. And then I'm going to pass over to my colleagues from the uh, system service providers, and they're going to provide a live demonstration of how to access the new retail energy location uh, data item within the two uh, systems. Um, for those of you who may not um, be uh, completely aware of what the um, retail energy uh, location is, I've put a link in the um, in the meeting chat uh, to a page on the REC portal, which is called REC version three baselined documents. Um, they are all the documents that are ready for go live into the REC on the 18th of July with REC version 3 when uh, the sequential switching service um, goes live. Um, for those of you who don't know maybe what the retail energy location is or, or some of the justification for why the rail has been introduced um, and the drivers for doing so, there's a really useful document within um, that that uh, that page under the tab um, called category three products. And the document is called the retail energy location guidance document. And it's a DCC document, data communications company. And it provides um, some really useful information about the purpose of the rail, uh, why it's been um, created um, the physical structure of it um, and it does give some more detail about how you might access it as, as we're going to have demonstrated to us today. So if there's context or questions about well, why do we need to use the rail, while we won't go into detail about that today because really the purpose is to show you how to use it rather than why to use it, um, that document is a really good um, place to access to answer some of those questions. Uh, we will be stopping after every section, as I mentioned, to answer questions, but we'll wrap up as well near the end for any questions that haven't been dealt with throughout the day. And then right at the tail end of the agenda, we'll address some questions on the uh, accessing the rail through uh, API, a machine to machine interface um, that Anne's going to pick up towards the end um, of the agenda. OK, um, before I hand over to uh, Christina, um, just checking that that nobody's got any issues um, with with Teams. I can't see that anyone has their their hand raised. Oh, Richard Marston, you've asked what the name of that document was. Uh, let me just uh, remind myself. Um, say it's it's under the Rec Version Three based on Documents page. It's the fourth tab, which is Category Three Products. Uh, you can see on the green bar. Hopefully, if you navigated to that page, and around um, I'd say three quarters to two thirds of the way down that page, there's something called the Retail Energy Location Guidance document document version 1.0 um, and there's a down link on, download link on that page there so if you've got questions about why the rail has been introduced um, then I recommend um, that you, you you check that out there all right um, let's uh, hand over now to Christina who's going to talk us through some of the changes to the gas inquiry service access agreement process thank you very much um so I'm Christina Vermoulin. I'm going to walk you through the different access agreements in place. If we scroll, here we go. Yep. So um, as RECO continues to develop the arrangement uh, to facilitate the access to the different REC services, we're going to um, explain what the different access agreement or accession agreements are in place, who the likely counterparty would be, and in under what circumstances it would be used. Just to note that this document is a contract um, or a variation to an existing contract. So if we move to the next slide. This table summarizes the, um, the different access agreements that we've issued or will be issuing. Um, just to summarize before we dive into them, we um, rec parties would encompass uh, suppliers, distribution network operators, gas transporters and MEMS, and the non-REC parties are organizations who would like to exceed the REC service. So for example, the first type of access agreement is the standard access agree agreement, which is required by any non-REC party organizations who wants to access a REC service. So the list of these users are set out in the schedule 12 of the REC, and it, 
this access agreement would allow a non-REC party to sign a contract with RECO to enable access to GES. The next access agreement is an access agreement amendment. So this relates to any existing non-REC party users who already has an access agreement and it would be an amendment of that access to encompass another service such as GES. So if there's a non-REC party with an already existing access agreement for EES, it would be amended to access the GES service as well. And last but not least, the supplemental agreement. So this is for REC parties who don't require an access agreement as they already have an accession agreement in place with the REC, but they require access to an additional service, then they would be required to complete this supplemental agreement. Um, this agreement would allow the REC party to access the additional service and contract with RECO for those specific service to commit to the charges payable. It's most likely to relate to bespoke reported or reports or existing standard reports and is uh, a contract for an additional service with it, which the REC party doesn't automatically receive under the REC. I just want to make a note as well here to highlight that if a gas shipper shares the, um, the same registration number for a REC party, that would be considered part of the, um, of the REC party. So the accession agreement would cover that particular gas shipper. If we move to the next slide. So most of organizations that had access to these service previously um, would have received their access agreement uh, by now. And if you haven't, it's on their way and will be received shortly via DocuSign. We're please do sign it by the 8th of July. So otherwise the access to the service will have to be removed on the 18th of July and you'll be required to go through the, the process uh, um, to regain access. If you did not have access previously and would like to do apply uh, via the REC portal from the 18th of July onwards, we are liaising with the different organizations um, through that mailbox inquiries at recmanager.co.uk in the meantime um, before go live in any case. So do reach out with any questions that, that you may have. I think that's all the updates that I have. Thank you, Christina. Uh, as you can see, we've got a few uh, questions raised on to uh, Slido. And just a reminder uh, to you again, you can access the Slido with that uh, a, uh, that, that QR code there or, or through Slido.com with that with that code. But three questions have been raised so far, Christina. Uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can uh, get this answered. Top. Just a reminder to, to if you can mute yourself when you when if you're not the presenter, that'll be handy. Thank you. Um, the top question there, uh, with each service different and recognising the benefits of RHEL comes from a single source, are there any plans to merge the inquiry service into a single inquiry service? I think we have Andrew Wallace on, on the call from, from RECO uh, by now. Andrew, I, I think this may be something that RECO are looking at strategically in terms of a, a consolidated inquiry service. Is there anything, anything more that we're able to say on that today? So, um, th thanks Paul. So I think um, for um, I guess for uh, retail code consolidation and for uh, CSS go live, then um, you know, the approach has been to take on the um, the existing uh, existing services. Um, I think it's fair to say that we understand the you know the potential benefits um, of bringing together um, the gas and electricity inquiry services, uh, and that's something that Retco uh, will be considering as a um, as a as a future um, strategic exercise. Thank you very much. Hopefully that was useful for the uh, uh, the question originator. Um, question number two: uh, Exa service stating that there is a risk of losing access to APIs unless contracts are in place. Any more information on this? And and the, the the other question as well is also around APIs. Whether we can clarify what gas APIs suppliers need listing a rec party that does not use APIs, whether any new agreements need to be signed. Christina, is this something you have a response on or is this something we should tackle later when we talk about APIs at the tail of the agenda? So um, Jane, do correct me if I'm wrong, but by the, um, the contracts in place, it's around the access agreements that we've been discussing previously. So I mean, it, it would be tackled on a case by case basis. So if, if you reach out to us, we'll, we'll verify the information and see whether you've got that access agreement or accession agreement in place. 
yeah, I was, that was exactly what I was going to say, Christina. That that that, that question actually is it's been answered in your in your slides around the access agreements and when they need to be signed by, um, and and any access agreements that aren't in place by the by by the eighth of July do risk the service being lost after CSS go live. But obviously, we will be in touch with you and we'll work together to make sure that you know everybody who has got access today and wants access after the eighteenth of July um, can still do that. Fantastic. I hope that answers the question, but please feel free to elaborate um, otherwise. Um, Richard asked, um, when will, will the GES access agreements be issued to suppliers? Uh, Exeter haven't been in contact yet. Has, has, has there been initial contact made? Has Richard missed something or, 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 is, there, or is there still emails to be sent on, on this subject matter? Uh, I don't know whether uh, that's a, uh, something for Christina or something for Exeter. Uh, yeah, well, it would be so the access agreements are all being sent out um, by um, by Deloitte as the rep code, code manager who are managing that piece. Um, but for suppliers as rec parties, they don't need to sign a separate access agreement. So there have been a number of communications, I think, both from Exeserve and Repco to, to that extent. But I see Andrew is on as well. Is there anything that you wanted to to add there, Andrew? to update on that question. No, I think you're absolutely right, Jane. Um, so access agreements um, will not be issued um, to suppliers. Um, they get access to the, the JES um, through their accession um, to the REC. Fantastic. So no, no action required for, for, for REC parties uh, in, in that respect. Great. At the top question on the, the board right now, um, if the service is lost for reasons of not having signed the access agreement, how is a party able to comply with its rec obligations to consult the retail energy location? Um, a, a fair a fair point. I don't know, um, Christina, whether that's something that uh, in your pot with your performance assurance um, hat on that the, 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 the team are considering in terms how a party is able to meet its obligations. Could I just, can I just, just yeah, jump please, in? Andrew. Yeah. So I, I think the, the obligation on a on a party um, to consult the rail is a supplier obligation. Mm -hmm. I think it's maybe kind of tied in with that that previous point um, that suppliers um, don't need to uh, sign access agreements as they will have access and uh, continued access um, to, to the service as they are uh, rec parties. Absolutely. Just noticed we have a, a hand raised in the chat and it's Richard and you'd previously asked a question, Richard. Is it? Is there an elaboration you wanted to point to the question you'd you'd raised earlier? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, so the only information I've had on this is on the 25th of May from the RECCO communication uh, email, which stated access servers as, as the provider of these services has contracted. Oh, sorry, wrong line. <laughs> um, your new GS access agreement will be provided to you with an effective date from 18th of July. Exaserve will be in contact with you as soon with you soon, detailed in next steps. We've had no communication since then. That's the only uh, communication I've had so far. Right, sorry, where are you calling from, Richard? Which part, which organisation do you e represent? E-gas and electricity. Sorry? E-gas and electricity. Is it is it possible? Um, so we'll, can we take this one up um, and uh, and pick it up with you, Richard, um, yeah, part sure. of the meeting, just to make sure um, that we understand kind of what what type of organisation you are and what type of um, agreement um, needs to be sent um, to you for for signature. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, well done. Fantastic. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, question then, uh, and it's whether there are separate agreements for GES and EES or whether it's the a single agreement. Now, my understanding, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, please, experts on the call, but there are, uh, again, we're not talking about rep parties here, but for non-rep parties, there are separate agreements for EES and GES that are required to be signed. Is that correct? Um, so if, if they already have access to EES, they would be issued an amendment to add that GES access to it. So it would be all under one. If if they don't have access to one of the systems, then it would be separate. So it will become a single a, a single agreement um, with the addition of a uh, an, an addendum to the the agreement that's already in place. Yeah. Fantastic. Hopefully that answers the question. A consolidated reporting. Uh, can suppliers get this info uh, in the time between the reports ending and the ability to source this via the APIs going live? I think this probably refers to the end of the 
um, consolidated report and M number reporting that, that's, that's ceasing at the moment. Uh, Andrew, is there is there anything on this that you are able to? Yeah, answer? so the, the I think the last consolidated report, the last monthly um, M number report, um, that will be in in July. Um, so, see, sub suppliers um, can access the the JES portal um, and. Um, we'll be able to um, access the um, the JES API um, from CSS Go Live. I guess the question the party is is pointing to is what happens if they haven't got um, the JES API um, in place and um, at, at the moment. Um, I think as Christina um, alluded to earlier, um, please contact um, the, um, the the code manager to register your interest. Uh, and they will discuss with you um, how best um, to, um, to to manage your application for an extension of that service of the JES service um, from the portal to the API. That's great. And, and Andrew, you referred to the availability of the uh, the N number file uh, report until July. The top question there suggests retirement on the thirtieth of June. Is 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 it, is it July that it's the availability extends to? No, so the last report is available. Sorry, Andrew, the last report report is available, will be published on the 30th of June. So the, the, the report, the information is available at the end of each month. I think the equivalent is available at the very start of July um, for, um, for on the electricity side, just to tie those two up. So, so to answer the question, why are we unable to apply uh, for get JES API until the 18th of July when X N number of files is being retired on 30th of June. It sounds like we acknowledge there is a gap, um, but but the uh, the because of the the changes being made in the for version three not going live until uh, the the 18th of July. I suppose the new processes for applications couldn't be switched on until that point. Is that, is that the justification for for why it's the 18th of July? So, um, so I think I think there there needs to kind of naturally be a, a kind of a, a, a gap um, to make sure that we can manage um, the transition. I think what um, Christina said um, earlier is that if you are kind of interested in applying for the API, then um, please kind of contact the code uh, code manager now so that they can discuss um, any kind of questions with you, um, and the application can be um, processed as as quickly as possible. Thank you. The last two questions on the screen then. Uh, I, I, yes, I think um, I think well, probably my colleagues from the EES search provider can provide an exact um, uh, uh, breakdown of what, what the difference is between EES and ECHOES. But yes, I think if you were previously referring to ECHOES, when we're talking about EES, that fundamentally we are talking about the, the same thing um, that, that you've been uh, used to. Um, it's just a, 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 with a different name now. It's the Electricity Inquiry Service. Um, and the final, final question, and and uh, yes, the data inquiry services X service is now the the gas inquiry service uh, for all intents and purposes. Um, so the very top one on top of the screen. If we need to update an address, will EES update Echoes, or will we need to do both? I'm not 100% sure who's yeah, best to answer I, that one, or if it's relevant to. to I, the point I think we what we'll do, I think probably the um, the question. Um, Possibly they may need to expand, but um, I know there was quite a lot of conversation around this in the original webinar. Um, is this where um, the client is, has found that there needs to be an amendment to the address? Um, I, I think what they're asking is, is how quickly that will be reflected in, in, in EES. Um, and if that is the context, they're actually asking that question. Obviously, EES is updated in, in real time. So from the NPRS information and the industry data, it's it's updated pretty immediately. So if there's been any sort of uh, address amendments um, that's been made, then it will be reflected in EES almost immediately. Thanks, Ash. OK, um, I think it's probably time to move forward into the if we if we if we I think we we're just focusing on 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 gas for now. I, I don't you don't need to withdraw the question. We'll pick it up when we when we come through um, when when we when we speak to the EES surge provider um, later in the session if that's all right. Um, but for now, I think we're going to pass over to Andrew, who's going to talk through um, as Christina did for the GES the changes to the process um, for accessing EES under version three. Andrew. 
Thanks, Paul. Um, good questions, everyone. So um, do do keep them coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Wallace. I'm the RETCO Switching Program Implementation Manager. Um, so I'm going to provide a quick overview of any practical and contractual requirements around access to the EES, um, what previously you referred to as ECHOs, um, after CSS Go Live. Um, so firstly, if you are an existing EES user, such as a supplier, a, a TPI, a MEM, etc., um, you will continue to have access to the EES um, from CSS Go Live. Um, that includes both your access to um, the web portal and to the API. So you don't have to do anything um, to continue to get um, that access. So the rest of the slide um, sets out some considerations for um, suppliers and for TPIs who will be able to access some additional um, CSS and uh, rel data. Um, so for um, from CSS Go Live, uh, suppliers will be provided with access to uh, additional CSS and rel data. Um, so the changes to um, the web portal uh, for suppliers will have effect automatically um, from the 18th of, of July and does not need to be requested. Um, Ash is going to from the CNC is, is going to give us a, a demo of that service um, later in the meeting. Um, for the API, um, suppliers will need to subscribe um, to the additional web service methods um, as described in the EES API technical specification. Um, that's the document that's available on the, on the REC portal. Um, so suppliers will need to subscribe to those web service methods um, to access the REL um, and the CSS data from the 18th of July. Uh, and lastly, for suppliers, um, you'll have API security. So those of you who access the API, you'll have security keys uh, and those security keys will continue to work. I'm aware that this is a there's a different approach uh, for, for JES, um, but for EES and um, the security keys are staying um, the same. Um, so moving on to um, the TPIs, um, uh, and this includes um, the, the, the price comparison websites. Um, so TPIs uh, must request access to um, the new CSS and rel data, and that's both for TPIs that have got uh, web portal access uh, and those are accessed via um, the API. Um, so Retco has written to the TPIs to um, explain that approach, um, and as, as set out in that uh, communication to TPIs, uh, we're not requesting um, that you re-sign um, the access agreements that you've already signed uh, with, with Retco. They are they are deemed to be amended, um, as they don't need to be uh, re-signed um, to get hold of the new data. But what what TPIs do need to do is they need to contact um, the code manager, and as part of that contact, um, to request access to uh, the new data. Um, so those. Um, those requests um, from TPIs, you want to get hold of the, the real data and the CSS data, you need to go to the code manager on the um, on the email address um, shown. Um, if you're a TPI and um, you don't want the additional data, you don't have to send a request um, and your, um, your access uh, will continue as it is um, after CSS Go Live. All right. That's all I had, Paul. Thank you very much, Andrew. We had some questions coming. I, I'm going to, um, if it's OK with, with people on the call, just focus for the time being on questions around uh, access um, here, because I think we, we might be able to get uh, more uh, complete answers if we put the questions around process to our surge providers after they provide their their bit in a in a moment. Um, so I think the top answer, the top question here, I think I'll just um, uh, part that uh, for now. Um, there was a question uh, a little bit further down, scroll down about will the Echoes consolidated report stop and, and Andrew I think we, we mentioned this slightly before but it is the plan isn't it to for the last Echoes consolidation report to be published in, in early July is that that's right? Great. Yeah that's great Paul. Absolutely uh, I think the the primary justification around that was um, the the quality of data and the the 
the currency of data, um, the encouragement being that suppliers shouldn't be relying on a consolidated report, which can be uh, quite quickly out of date. Uh, so that's the new process is being brought in around that. Um, uh, again, just trying to focus on the ones that, that, that are appropriate at the moment. Um, Will exceeded REC suppliers automatically gain access to EES and JES inquiry services even if they don't have APIs yet? I think I'm right in saying, uh, Andrew, that the, the access for API and, and portal access are, are treated slightly separately. Is that right? So if they don't currently have. Yeah, so I think if, if you are if you are a REC um, supplier and you've got access um, to the EES portal, then that's what you'll have after CSS go live. If you've got access to the API and the portal, that's what you'll have um, after um, CSS go live. So it's it's a it's a rollover of your um, existing um, arrangements, and that's true both for um, the EES and the and the GES. Thank you. Um, how how do suppliers access the APIs once they've contacted the code manager? How how does it work in practice? Will system changes be needed to gain access to the APIs? Not sure whether that's a reco or probably more likely a EES service provider question. Is that something that is is worked through on a on a on an individual basis with an applicant? Um, so it, it, if this is a it's just for people who already have the APIs, um, then if you are an electricity supplier and you already have the API. Um, then you'll be able to subscribe to the additional uh, web service methods um, to get hold of the CSS um, and the rail data. And that's something that suppliers will be able to do for themselves, uh, won't need to contact the code manager, won't need to contact um, the CSS um, provider. OK, thank you. If there's any elaboration required from part on that one, please feel free to put a new question in. Is the domain going to remain the same for EES? I think it's it, it's it's not a new term for EES now, although it's uh, people still re recognise it as echoes. It actually has been called EES since it's been wrecked. I think there are no uh, plans at the, the moment to change. The domain name. You're, you're right, Paul. The echoes domain name stays exactly yeah. um, as it is. I'm, I'm waiting for a kick from Ash in case I get any of these wrong, but that's my understanding. <laughs> not at all. Fabulous. Um, and the same question there, the new one, will EES users have new login details or will Echo's uh, login work for EES? There are no changes as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as I'm made aware to any of that information either. Um, I think that's probably enough for the time being on access. I don't think there's any more questions on there, but I did notice that there was a question that came through the chat. Um, what about agents, uh, says John McMillan, uh, such as MEMS DCs accessing EES who already have access? I, is, is the same apply uh, for, for the current rec parties that if you're a supplier agent, does your access continue? That's correct. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your question, John. <laughs>
Um, and today we've got this beautiful picture of a waterfall in Iceland, I believe. Um, but the first thing that you'll see as in way of change when you actually log into EES is that you'll see this terms of usage. Um, and it's got this extra line in here saying that they're using the retail energy location solely to assist in the purposes of customer switching. And that's the wording that you will see within um, that terms of usage. And opting to actually agree to that indicates that the user is access accessing EES for the purpose of aiding customer switching and is therefore entitled um, in accordance with your access agreement um, as, uh, as Andrew and Christina have gone through with you. So obviously by accepting, agreeing and continue, we get the search criteria. Um, now there is there is some amendments that you can actually make to the user settings uh, with the EES. If the user wants to search and view the retail energy location address for switching purposes, they can adjust their user settings. And the way that they would actually adjust their user settings is through this uh, this little icon here and it gives you a drop down. So it means that the user can actually tailor uh, what information they see in accordance with what they're actually using the system for. So if they are using it for switching or perhaps they don't want to actually display the REL address, uh, perhaps they just want to see the MPL address, depending on the many, many different uses that people have for, for EES. But you can actually tailor or as you can see it in accordance with you know what menu position everyone has their own preference uh, but you can also switch the rel information on and off and obviously confirm that you're using it for switching purposes should you feel the need to do so so the search criteria and, and again i'm going to reiterate the point that the search criteria has not changed within ees so you know if in this particular situation it was a meter point location um, can be found through a search on the MPAN or the meter serial number. It will only bring up the meter point location. Um, but if the search item consists of postcodes or address information, it will bring both the MPL and the REL address data. So the first example I'm going to show you um, of that is actually a commercial example. And we're going to search the uh, system via an MPAN. And what you will see immediately is that it will give you exactly the same address as you all know and love. Um, it will give you the address information with the MPAN information. This is a commercial example and we can see that by the little icon of the factory as opposed to a house. And obviously it's indicating that the domestic indicator is false. And you can see that there is no information that has actually changed on there. So if you were already an EES user, you'd be very, very familiar with this information. Um, this particular example doesn't have any information with regard to uh, central switching service, but I will give you an example a little bit later on where you'll see different elements within that search criteria, which will show you information if that particular address is going through um, a change of supplier. So you can see that in this information, for those of you who haven't seen EES before, you'll see that it's got MPAN information. Um, it's got information around the supplier, the agents, the settlements, current meter details, and obviously a good dealing of supplier and meter history there. The second example I'm going to show you, we're going to do something slightly different because as I said to you before, if you're actually searching via the MPAN, it will only give you the MPL address. But if you were already in that MPAN um, and you wanted to actually see if there was real information, you can click on this locator button. And if there is rel information there, it will give you information around that that rel information. So if on your initial search, you look through the MPAN and it only gave you the MPL address, you can go to that locator button and it will give you the rel address also and also the UPRN. The next example we're actually going to use. Um, a lot of questions. We did get some questions from uh, the webinar last time around um, the more obscure um, Scottish addresses. These are the addresses that have got the dots and the dashes and um, and all sorts of weird and wonderful formats um, and how that would actually show and how we can see that um, within the system. Now we are limited as to what we can actually show you within the electricity inquiry service. 
because the system is so efficient, it will give you every example um, that fits the criteria of the search. And obviously for the purposes of the demonstration, we can't show you all of the addresses. We can only show you the addresses that we have permission for. But in this particular example, we have 1-161 Early Street. Uh, so let me demonstrate that for you. And what you can see there is, is that it's actually brought up the MPAN information as we saw in the first example, as you all know and love it. But what it's also done is actually brought up the REL information and you can see that it's brought up the address type in accordance with the DPA, the delivery point address and the REL address in accordance with the local property identifier. The local property identifier is the local authority address, so that will give you sort of the more infrastructural um, uh, choice of, of addresses, if you like. Um, but the delivery point address is actually where the letters get posted. So that's the difference between the two. But you can see that this is the only change that you will see um, with your search criteria with the introduction of the REL is that it will give you the MPL if you are using elements of the address in order to actually do your search. But again, what we can see is if we go into that information, exactly the same information, no changes unless that particular address was going through a switch. And that's the next example I'm going to show you is that hopefully we'll be able to actually demonstrate. And the next domestic example that we've got for you. is 36 May Lane, Dursley, Gloucestershire. Um, and again, what you can see, because we've used the elements of the address, we've used the, um, the house type and the postcode, it's actually given us both the MPL and the REL address. The difference with this address is, is that what you can see here is, is you can see an example of the CSS switching summary um, and this is the, the next difference. So the, the main difference that you'll see, um, as I say, it, it, it gives you the additional REL information. But the next bit of information that you'll see is additional CSS data. Um, so the current supplier and the supply data taken from the last successful registration synchronization mes message. So these are the messages that are actually coming in from CSS to actually advise us of the switching. So what you'll see on the bottom here is a summary of the, the switching messages. Um, it gives you sort of an indication of what status that is in of the messages that we've actually received and the dates in which that's happened. So it's almost sort of a, a summary of events. So you can see that um, there are pending statuses, there is registration cancelled, registration event, registra registration secured active, excuse me, I just put my teeth back in. Um, and it can give you sort of a series, a, a summary, if you like, um, a history of the messages that have actually been received and also where that particular um, supply is within the switching process. Is okay. that the is that the demo? Is there any more? It is, yeah. Just there are some little links within the switching summary, which just gives you some further information, and, and that's just sort of a, a hovering information um, indicator, uh, which can actually expand on that. But that is literally the changes that you will see through the introduction of the REL and CSS for EES. That's great. If, if I if I leave the uh, your screen on with the demo at the moment, uh, j just just and I'll go through the questions that I can see here, uh, just in case there are any that you might be able to to, to, to demonstrate. Um, the question here around obviously you showed searching with the postcode uh, address, you showed searching through the MPAN. The question is whether you can search EES using the REL ID or the UPRN, almost like a backwards search, as it were. Is that possible? Um, not that I'm aware of. Let me double check that, but I don't think you can actually use the UPRN. I think it is via the um, the address and the MPAN information only. OK, no worries at all. Thank you. Um, a question 
which I think actually might be more relevant for. I know we've got um, Adam Lydiard and Richard Clark from DCC on, on the call as well. I wonder if this might be more uh, appropriate for you to answer or someone close to the programme. The question is, uh, why should we search for the rail at all if we can get the meter number without accessing the rail? I'll pick Thanks, Richard. Oh, you muted yourself again, I think. Sorry, um, for some reason it muted me halfway through. Um, the whole purpose of um, faster and more reliable switch is that you use the REL ID, which will be common for a single property across gas and electricity. Um, so you can use the REL to find the meters that are switchable at a particular property. Then you can use the same REL ID at the, um, the other inquiry service so that you know you're actually looking at the same switchable group of meters. So um, the intention is that you standardize around the, the retail energy location address, which is a standard BS 766 format address. And uh, hopefully you're not using an obscure address to try and find a meter to switch. Thank you. There's another uh, question which. Yeah, may finally, be just on that. Um, obviously, the poor any poor quality data in the MPL will also have been removed, and I'll thank my colleague Adam for prompting me in the background. Thank you. Another question which might be pertinent, um, uh, or, or I don't know if a question or as much a statement, uh, and I don't. I'm, I apologise for not knowing the acronym on this one, but for MBC, if the customer has provided the MPXN, the supplier does not need to consult REL before the switch as per the reg services schedule. Um, not sure if you can provide any background on that point. Um, I don't know what MBC means. No. OK, uh, if, if anyone wants to elaborate on that one, either put your hand up in the chat or or send a. Uh, oh, there is a hand up in the chat. Who, who, who we got? Hi, it's Andrew from. Hi, Andrew. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm assuming that's a micro business consumer. So the register is correct. The registration services schedule uh, of the rec when it comes in on uh, go live uh, requires the rel to be consulted for uh, domestic switch and if you and for a micro business switch but if you've got the MPXN uh, you can use that for micro business so you don't need to uh, consult the rel. Thank you very much. Um, another question which is I think pertinent for the DCC actually while we've got you uh, could, whether you can please explain the confidence score in the rel and I think this is to do something with the the gold standard is it is yeah. my terminology correct there so the confidence score is when the initial match was done from the original meter point location address that is a, a measure of correlation between the original meter point location address and the address found in ordnance surveys address based premium it is not any in any way a measure of the confidence of the search criteria you entered into EES or GES for that matter. Um, it is just a degree of correlation between um, the original source address, meter point location and the retail energy location. Thank you very much. Um, just going through some of the outstanding questions again, just having a look through. Lorne has asked whether updated EES user guides are available just now, and if not, when they'll be ready as they form the basis for agent training. I think, Lorna, the link that I posted in the chat to the REP version 3 baseline documents um, does contain latest um, user guides as drafted. If you again go into the tab called Category 3 Products and scroll to the bottom of that page, there are various version 3s of EES user guides which each look at the different um, category of, of industry participants. So I think there's a distributor one, a supplier, a supplier one, a supplier agent one, non-domestic consumer user guide. So, so that will be the place to, to visit that. That's the REC version 3 baseline documents page on the REC portal. That's correct. Uh, noted another comment coming through in chat from Anne Claire whether the REL ID shows on EES. The REL ID. Can you expand on that? Feel free to unmute Anne Claire if you want to. Uh... Somebody just said that the REL ID will be common across gas and electricity. In way of the UPRN. What was, is that what the REL ID is? 
Yeah, they both contain the same value at the moment. Sorry for butting in. Yeah. So the UP, you can see there that the UPRN is actually shown and displayed in the ES most definitely. OK, so is that what's common across gas and electricity? That's the consistent value, isn't it, that that, that appears in, in both the gas and electricity system, yeah. the value within that UPRN field, otherwise known at the moment as the UPR, as the REL ID. Thank you. Um, I just want to do one more question. I think we'll move on to the uh, the Jez demo and then we'll pick up all the rest of the questions at the tail end, if, if that's OK. Um, there's a question around uh, where someone might be able to find a, a simple guide of EES and GES, detailing high level overview of what the systems are, how access can be gained um, and what will change. Is this something that the, the user guides for, for both are intended to pick up, um, Ash? And I suppose um, speak to my ex sort of colleagues as well for the GES equipment. But is that the purpose of the user guides on the on the rep portal? I think the user guide is is to a more granular level, so it is literally a step by step guide as to how you would actually um, navigate your way around around the system. Um, depending on how level how high level you're actually looking for, it, the user guide is aimed at the person who's actually doing sort of the the point and click type activity uh, with regard to sort of a summary of what the service does, most certainly the user guide will give you that, but it will also give you the granular level of, of the point and click type navigation. Thank you, Ash, appreciate it. Uh, I think Ash is going to stick around, so so if there are any questions that, that come up um, between now and the end of the session, I'm sure uh, please um, uh, please do keep keep them um, keep them coming and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. But for the time being, I'm going to pass over to Andy Steed, um, who's the surge provider for the gas inquiry service and we'll provide a similar demonstration um, for how we access the, the rail within JES. Please feel That's free good. to share your screen, Andy. Yeah, one second. Here we go. Everyone can see that? Yeah, we're good. Cool, excellent. So this is the uh, JES online portal, and it, as you can see, it look, anyone who's familiar with the existing uh, DES portal will see that this is very familiar. Uh, we have a, a number of functions across this light blue bar across the top. Um, the search function is the existing search where anyone can go in and search for specific meter points and find the relevant uh, sort of gas data related to it. Um, uh, we've added the CSS registration ID as a search criteria in there. Um, but here we're specifically looking at the rel search. So yeah, we've got a separate separate search functionalities for gas data and specific search for rel search. Um, so it works in a, in a very similar way. We have a um, terms of usage button at the bottom, which you have to tick to agree that you're using the search for um, uh, for switching purposes. Uh, but other than that, we can enter any any date details as as much as we know relating to the, the property that we were looking for uh, and hopefully um, come back with some addresses. So similar to the uh, the electricity presentation, we've got three addresses which we're going to go through. So the first one was in May Lane. Uh, in Dursley, and that was number 36. So we enter 36 in the building number and we'll go into a specific postcode in the full postcode field for this one, which is GL114HU. And then we click on the search. And then we, we, we this is what's called the rel search detail screen. So if your search uh, results in a single um, meter point being found, then you'll get taken directly to this uh, REL search detail screen, which pro provides the um, meter point location address at the top, and then it will provide any associated REL addresses listed below um, with all the, the data underneath their specific headings. So for this one, uh, you can see here that we've got an MPL address, uh, sources from the MPL address, um, and it's a DPA address. So I think similar. This is this is uh, all coming from a test system. So this is not exactly the data that you'll see in the live system. Um, so this one I know has uh, an LPI address as well associated with it. Um, so you'll just if in the live system you'll see that below it 
uh, it'll just list any addresses uh, below. So I know you can have multiple um, logical statuses as well. So any associated row addresses will be listed here on this page. And uh, then should you wish to perform another search, there's a number of ways you can go back to the search screen. You can either click up here um, to take you back to the search and it'll that'll give you a blank search field, uh, search um, search screen again, or you can return to the rel search via these breadcrumbs here where it just follows your path through the searches. So if I click on here, you can see that it takes me back to the search and it leaves my uh, search criteria populated. So if I wanted to tweak it some way, then we could we can just go back and do that. Uh, but for the next search I'm going to do is a flat in Scotland. So uh, for this one, we know again the postcode is the key data item really. So G129 SR. Um, and we know we're looking for flat one slash one. Um, but I don't think we'd, we'll be able to specifically add that data into the search. So we're going to go with a building number, which we know is 61, which is the name of the number of the building. And then what we would do uh, is perform a search here, um, and that would then bring back the results screen, which um, I'm not able to do because that will display a number of us, number of results, which I don't have permission to show, but I do have the, have a screenshot with the relevant data blanked out. So if I did click search now, what we were displayed with is this rel search results screen. Uh, and this displays all of the real results, um, all the meter points and their rel addresses for that meet your search criteria if it results in a sort of multiple addresses being found. So here you can see we found a number of uh, properties which meet the search criteria of having a, a building number of 61 and a postcode of G129SR. Um, and these would all then display the, 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 the different flat numbers. So we can see that we're looking for one slash one. And we've clearly identified that one uh, as being this specific address. So the way you then and you could then enter into that detail screen by clicking on this NPRN, the blue highlighted blue uh, NPRN, and that would take you directly to the, the detail screen. And I can take you to that detail screen um, by performing another search, but we'll go via postcode this uh, via uh, the NPRN this time. So I've got the NPRN here for that specific address. But we could either search, we could either use the, the registration ID, confirmation reference, the UPRN, uh, and that should take us directly to the flat that we're looking for. And you can see here that we, this one's worked correctly and that we've got a DPA and an LPI address and all of the relevant um, rel address fields populated. Uh, and for the final address that we're going to display is a commercial address, and that's one for that one we're going to use here is uh, the Ofgems office in South Colonnade in Canary Wharf. So again, um, I'm going to use the postcode and we know that it's number 10. And if I perform that search, we should get taken directly to the search details results screen for the relevant property. And you can see uh, the same again. Uh, we've got the MPL address, the registr CSS registration idea, a UPRN, and then we've got the relevant red addresses populated below. I think that's the end of my uh, presentation. That's great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the update. As before, I'll, I'll just see whether there's any questions that may be relevant to the, the demo before I ask you to stop sharing your screen. I think the um, one of the questions uh, that came up in the the last one was relevant for yourself as well, and that's whether you could sort of backwards search. Are you able to search using the UPRN and find the information, or yeah. does that that would it work? Out? So, yeah, so we have an you we have a specific UPRN field at the bottom here, which we've added in. So you can search by UPRN, and you can search by CSS registration ID if you've got that data, and that will that will match to the relevant relevant rel address. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, 
I've put a um uh, before I go on to answer some the next questions. I've, I've put a link within the the, the chat um for, for this event. A lot of the questions being asked is sort of um focusing on the the switching process itself and the the sort of data flow process and rejections uh, uh, and things like of that nature. Primarily, we were here today to have a look at the changes that are happening to how we access these systems and how we access the rail within this system. While we can attempt to answer them. The people that we've got on the call today aren't necessarily going to be the right people to answer some of those specific questions. So what I've done is actually um, link through an event that we're hosting next week on the 28th, which is an introduction to switching on direct version three, including the the impacts on some of the surge provider systems. Um, it may be pertinent for you to to either attend or, or make sure you access the recording for that session as well, where some of those things may be speak, spoken about in more detail. Just wanted to be clear that I, we'll try and answer your questions today but 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 for some of them we, 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 we they may be better answered or more appropriately answered at the, the session next week um, but I, I will we'll see what we can do in terms of answering um, some of them um, uh, and indeed, we, we've reached the part of the agenda now. In any case, that we are um, into the Q Q and A section, so hopefully we can we can we can answer some of them. Um, to that respect. Um, Actually, if I do switch over, if it's all right to, to share mine again, I don't think there's going to be anything that we uh, that we need to have a look at your demo for. So no flip it back over there uh, and go back to the top questions that have been asked and see whether we can we can get through as many of them as possible. Uh, and this one is one of those sort of switching processing, but I don't know, uh, perhaps you will be able to answer this, Andy. Um, what happens if Exaserve rejects a suggested address update from a supplier? Um, do we? A, a, is that a question that we can answer today or is that one best part until next week's session? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can. I don't know if anyone uh, else from Exasurf can answer. I don't know if Mike can answer it or anyone else is aware of, of this one. I'll give it a go, Andy. Um, go so, I mean, if um, from a gas shipper point of view, you were trying to amend the meter point address um, through our contact management system, it would follow the same process as it does today. So if we were to reject your, your update, you would receive that, that relevant rejection in the same way you would do today. That, that part of the process does not change at all. And, and Ash, I'm not sure whether you can give a, the same answer or is it the same confidence from a EES side? Is, it, is there any change to that process as far as we're concerned? Not as far as I'm aware. The process is exactly the same way. There was, there was quite a discussion around this in the original webinar, um, and I think there was some comfort given from DCC that you know the the, the whole change process was uh, was was remaining uh, the same as it is now. I, I don't think there's any carte blanche changes. Thank you. Um, when I access EES and GES, can I update my customer billing system with this standard address information? I don't know whether that's something that needs to be defined on an individual organisational level, or whether there's some support that the service providers are able to provide. I come in there on that yep. one straight. Um, you cannot use the retail energy location for customer billing information. It is not in accordance with the standard license condition, which is to use it for the purpose of switching only. Wonderful. That's 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 crystal clear then. Thank you very much for the for the response there. Uh, wonderful. Um, so this is again a more of a, a sort of switching process question about how is the EES update made when a supplier decides it needs to be updated? I, again, not sure there's any sort of change from from today's sort of status quo with that. Ash, is there anything you can? No, the, the industry data is exactly the same way, and yet the updates from NPRS are in. It, nothing's changed from that respect at all. All right. Um, can we get an overview of the business logic we should apply to know the order of access, um, with particularly with dual fuel switches? Should we access GES or EES first, uh, or indeed, does it matter? And can it be answered today? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> um, I, I think this is this is not something that um, Retco um, or the code manager um, can ad advise on. Um, this is this is a. a, a an issue for um, parties who use the services um, to determine for, for themselves based on um, their own operational um, arrangements. Thank you, Andrew. Um, 
going back to a previous question, um, if an exceeded REC supplier with no existing APIs requests one, do they need system changes to use APIs? I, I, th I think if, if memory serves right, uh, there is sort of the EES and GS search providers will sort of support onboarding onto a new API if the request comes through. Is, is that is that right, um, search providers? Yeah, most certainly. So there, there may be, uh, so from a, from a key perspective, obviously there is a, a key given to the client with regard to private and, and public key. Um, so yeah, your techie people may need to get involved in actually sort of embedding that key and doing um, a slight amount of coding, but there are supporting documents and, and obviously support from the service providers in order for them to actually do that. Thank you, Ash. Appreciate it. Um, a question here, if the two rel addresses are different, which one is used for switching and do we need to update both? So I think this is where we saw there are there are multiple lines potentially returned on the rel, isn't it? Um, and the question, which one should we should we be using for switching and does it matter, I suppose? Is that a DCC question? I don't think it is, but um, I'll have a go anyway. <laughs> um, so it depends what the customer has told you. So if there are different REL addresses, you have a duty to consult the REL to work out which one's most appropriate to use to identify the meter that is the subject of the switch. We can't tell you which, which of the two to use, for example, but what we would do is encourage you to talk to your customer to ensure that you have the correct one. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, both UK Link MPRS for MPL and C oh, it's a lot of acronyms uh, and CES for rel, but if MPL correction is accepted, will it not update CSS with rel again? We need to see an end to end process for this. Uh, I'm not sure whether any of our panel of speakers has any clarity or, or insight on us to this point. Any, any offers? Sure, I fully uh, have the detailed technical knowledge to, uh, to assess that. Perhaps this is this is probably a question um, well asked on the on the on the, at the, at the intro to the switching and rep version three webinar if, if needed to. But also, if you if you need to get further clarity sooner, you can drop us a line afterwards and we can see whether we can investigate an answer to that one. Okay. Um, acronyms for address types are they all explained in the portal? Um, I think they're probably um, mostly explained in the user guides. We do have a, a, a an acronym buster page within our REC wiki um, on the portal, and it's something that if we've identified um, acronyms that have been used today that aren't on there, I'll certainly attempt to um, draw them out in, in, in the portal wiki area. So thank you for flagging them. There's certainly some acronyms raised today that I don't recognise as well, so I'll be looking for, for my own sanity to, to get them clarified. Um, Question on uh, how new DES logins should be requested for uh, shippers. Uh, this is logins on a on an individual level rather than on a uh, organisational level, I suppose. Um, any of uh, my Exaserve colleagues have an answer on this one, or indeed um, from uh, Christina, code manager. Or is this something we should take away? Uh, is it, uh, the current process for establishing an individual persona on DES, is, is, that, is that changing? So I think, um, hi, hi, Andrew Wallace. Hi, Andrew. So I think in, in relation to um, in, individual kind of users, then that, that'll be managed by the, um, the MAU um, for, for the shipper. Um, I wonder whether this question is, is just checking to understand if there are any changes to logins that, um, come as a result of um, uh, CSS go live um, and I think you know it sounds like when we probably need to go back and, and check and, and clarify and um, post meeting. Thank you Andrew. Just to clarify so this is just this was just a is there a change to how we request user logins via our LSOs? Okay so I think the answer is um, there is a uh, as part of the um, the JES portal user guide. Um, there is a there is a new document uh, which describes um, how the the kind of LSO MAU 
um, function works. Uh, my understanding is that it is it is as as previously, um, but it's worth I say worth I'm advertising the uh, uh, the JEDS portal user guide to, to help people understand um, how that will work. And on the chat right now, someone's asked for the uh, this um, the user guides to be added again, so I'm just adding a link um, to the page of the portal where these are stored and it's under the category three products tab. All the separate baseline user guides for rep version three um, can be found within there. Um, that's across EES with the different categories, user type, categories of user type and across GES as well. So please navigate through that link. You shouldn't need a rep portal login to be able to, uh, to be able to go and see those documents. Um, while I'm in the chat, I've noticed that there's been a question from, or is it a point of clarification from from Andrew Dawson um, here with respect to a question about storage of rel addresses. Ordnance Survey advises that you can store the rel address, but only if you have an appropriate address based premium license. Uh, you can store the UPRN and lat and long data, which are open data. Thank you for that clarification, Andrew. Um, Moving back into the uh, questions again. Um, Andrew touched on checking the rel for a micro business, but I've just checked the rec schedule and the wording on this is different to previously shared. Um, is I think that was Andrew Marto, wasn't it? Is, is there any clarity that can be given on? Uh, have there been obligations that have changed recently around around this? Do we know? Not as far as I was aware. The uh, I think that schedule was baselined back in November or December last year. I was just going off of the, the version that's available which i think is on the portal so it does call out that in the case of a micro business unless the consumers provided or confirmed the mpxn the gaining supply must only submit a switch request to css uh, where the, uh, the mpan has, and uh, rel address has been validated Thank you for clarification, Andrew. If there's any further points of clarity we can give to the question originator on that, feel free to get in touch afterwards, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll find out uh, some more clarity for you. Um, okay, if the consumer raised address correction request with a registered supplier after switch is live, um, whether supplier should check both the rail and MPL and raise request to. Is there anyone who can give some more clarity on? what that question is trying to understand. I'm not sure I fully understand the, the context. Maybe that it was asked at a more uh, time where we we're talking about something more relevant and I've moved on. But we can come back to it uh, later on if, if, if someone wants to clarify, uh, otherwise I'll move on for now. Uh, as a supplier party that already uses the API, do we need to subscribe to the additional WSMs? Have I missed another acronym? Um, <laughs> that, that, that's, yes, that's the web service methods. Um, so there's so there's no compulsion on a supplier um, to subscribe um, to those to get the rel or the, the CSS data, um, but there is a there is a requirement um, on suppliers to have you know checked the rel um, prior to um, sub submitting a switch, um, but that supplier um, may choose to do that in a different way. Um, for example, um, via the um, via the, the the web portal. I'm going to do a few quick fire things through this now because we do have a, set, a a few slides to go through from Anne on API questions. Um, the, the the top point here from Andrew Dawson. Uh, we're told in the April webinar that TPIs can display the rail web websites, but suppliers can't. OS advises there should be no discrepancy. Is there any clarification on that? Is is that uh, we, I think we've we've touched on um, use of the the rail. Probably, bit. probably if I come in there again. Um, yep, please. Rail cannot be displayed on any public facing website unless a separate agreement is reached with Ordnance Survey. So I don't know whether TPIs where TPIs have got that uh, understanding from, but it's not correct. OK, if there's any further information we can provide, again, if you can get in touch with us afterwards and we can support with any understanding of that one. Um, uh, what report from Echoes is being discontinued in mid-July? That's the uh, consolidated report that, that some parties may have been receiving um, under previous arrangements and the, the final consolidation report will be issued in uh, in early July. That's the equivalent of the M number report being provided out of uh, the, the DES. 
Uh, will GES have access to SDEP? I, th I think I'm right in saying that SDEP is a dual fuel service. I don't think GES as a system uh, per se has access to SDEP, but I do think that gas parties have access to SDEP and the processes within. Uh, unless that is correct. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's correct. Okay. You can't uh, visually, you, yeah, you can't actually search any sort of gas data, but how a step works is it identifies obviously um, your gas pits, which allows you to actually utilize the system for dual. Absolutely, thank you. I've shared the links for the GES and EES user guides. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no changes to the GES domain, just the same as there's no changes to the EES domain moving from Echoes. I assume that the silence means that it's probably the case. Um, and indeed, uh, I don't think there's any change to login information. It's, it's nomenclature changes rather than anything sort of technical or functional as far as I understand. Um, we have an agreement with REC for EES online portal, uh, which gas services are being added into mod 422. Will the removed reports be replaced? Um, does anyone have clarity on that from our speakers? I, I can pick that one up if, if you, you want. So, you. So, um, so I guess similarly to those JES um, users who have um, access to um, the API or, or the portal, if you take a um, a standard um, report or a, um, a bespoke report, um, then your access to that report is is being rolled over under under the REC. Um, and the code manager will be in contact um, to make sure that you have an access agreement or uh, an access amendment agreement or a supplement supplementary agreement as as Christina um, talked about um, to make sure you've got the right permissions to continue to get um, that report. Fabulous, thank you very much. Um, I can see a real classification, a real field called classification with a code in it. What's this? Do we know what the rail classification code is? I think that was within the um, is that within the GES system? And while we're on GES, are there plans for GES to start showing historical supplier data um, like EES does? Any plans on GES changes from my Exaserve colleagues there? So I don't, I don't with regards to adding additional data other than CSS and the rail. I don't think there's any changes being made to whether we display historical um, supply data as far as I'm aware. Thanks Andy. Do, I don't know whether this was the other one was related to GES, but a rail field classification. Do we know what that it might be? Yeah, it was. It was like an RD zero something number in the GES portal. Thanks for that. Yeah, so that'd be something I, I, can, answer, with, I yeah. can answer that. That's so. the Ordnance Survey's address base um, classification code that goes with all the address base addresses. I'll pop a link to the descriptions um, from the OS website in the chat in a second. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Uh, and just finally, finally, uh, why hasn't DSG change management moved under the REC in preparation for GES? Uh, again, acronyms. I'm not too sure about DSG. Um, is anyone involved in that group and, and understand why it's not yet under the REC? Questions for, <laughs> for outside, maybe. I wonder maybe. whether that's um, um, that DSC, is that a reference? Yeah, I was gonna, that's what I was just going to ask. So if you ask the question, clarify if it, they mean DSC, change management. Is that is that Carl? Carl, just seeing your hand raised. Uh, my hand was raised for something else, but DSG oh, is a delivery subgroup. Right. Which is it's, it's um, under DSG. So the DSG, the DSG, the delivery subgroup is currently under the the DSC. Is that right? Under DSC governance. Is that what the, the clarification was there? OK. Fantastic. So, so yes, Carl, so that remain under DSC. That's going to remain. That's a decision to remain under the DSC. OK. Uh, Carl, you did have your hand raised to something else you said there. Yeah, sorry, it was a few questions ago. It was just around whether suppliers that have existing access to the APIs need to subscribe to the new web service methods for rail and CSS. And the answer that was provided was given in a way to say we weren't mandated to. Like I, I understand that I understand the obligation is to check the rail, not the obligation is to subscribe to the services. But the question was, do we actually need to 
go and subscribe to those services or will we just receive them automatically because we already have the other API services? Um, so in relation to the EES um, API, um, if you don't do anything, um, then you won't get access to um, the, the rel and the, the CSS data. Um, so you would need to um, um, subscribe to those web um, service methods as a supplier um, to get access to that data um, from the um, from CSS Go Live. Is that is that process described in the three point one whatever spec it is that's on there now? Um, I would I would need to um, I would need to check. Um, if it's not in there, um, then it's certainly something we can um, consider um, how we provide any useful guidance um, to to suppliers. Um, my, my understanding is that from a, a technical point of view, um, suppliers would be able to um, subscribe to those uh, web service methods without any um, requirements uh, for support from from CNC and from the code manager. It's a, it's a self-serve activity. Right, OK, I'll uh, chat with our tech teams that they've done it then. Thank right. you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Carl. I, I, I do want to give Anne a little bit of time to go through the last couple of slides. <coughs> just 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 want to answer very finally the last question on this here. Uh, there was a bit of confusion about what the consolidated re report is that is going to come to an end. Um, the consolidated report, as I understand it, Andrew might be able to give more detail than I am, but fundamentally it was a monthly report that was provided uh, to parties who had requested access to it, which was essentially a cut of data from ECHOES, now EES, um, at a moment in time, a snapshot at a moment in time. That report is being discontinued because the switching programs drive for suppliers to access and use current live data to help with data quality. That's the report that's being stopped. Other reports that are accessed directly from EES through CNC and the search providers will continue, but the consolidated report is coming to an end. Am I right there, Andrew? Have I got that right? Uh, yeah, no, perfectly right. And it's uh, uh, the only additional thing to say is it, it was a it is a report. Um, that's currently available to um, suppliers and DNOs only um, who request access to that report. But I'm the last last one uh, will be published at the, the start of July. Fabulous. Thank you very much. And I've not given you much time. We've got about six minutes left, but we've we've got a few questions that were received in advance on um, accessing the API. So I'll I'll let you uh, you take it away with a few minutes on this. Yeah, great. Yeah, so I know obviously we've had quite a lot of questions um, through the session, but these were specific, uh, specifically submitted beforehand, so we thought it was still worth going through these. Um, so I'll just talk through them, what the answer is. Some we have already referred to or already touched on, so it is kind of a bit of repetition, but I think we'll just kind of close it off. So the first one relates to um, the report that we're talking about. So is there uh, another report within the industry that will supply um, NPRM postcode? and the size of the supply point. Um, so as kind of Paul mentioned that the existing report has been removed as part of the switching program. Um, and this is to encourage parties to access up-to-date information as part of the, the switching processes. What we do recognise though is if actually, however, there is a, um, a need or parties that feel there is a need for um, additional reporting to be put back in place, this is something that we would consider as part of a change proposal that a party would need to raise. However, we would consider as part of that change uh, proposal the reason why it was removed in the first place. But there is an option there for something to be explored if needed at a, at a future point. Um, next question was around uh, what data limits are there on, on manual searches? Um, so uh, kind of for awareness that the limits on those manual searches is set out in the service definition documents uh, for both EES and GES. Uh, we've provided the links and then Paul will share the slides so people can access that, but it is in that REC version 3 baseline documents uh, section within the, the REC portal. Uh, for, for EES, uh, the metering point searches uh, are limited by default to 600 per day per authorised person, so at an individual level. And for GES, uh, usage is going to be monitored um, and if there is any concerns around the volume of searches that are being completed, um, that will be something that the, the, the GES provider kind of will, will raise to the, the, the code manager. Kind of moving on from a, a, a kind of a, a cost perspective then. 
what we then got is, is there a cost to set up the APIs? Um, so there aren't any specific costs for setting up the, the JES API. For the EES API, um, setup uh, charges only apply to third party intermediaries, so to TPIs and to TPI service providers, Alt, Han, Co. And the, the Micro Generation Certification Scheme, so MSC. Um, and um, that information around those charges, it is set out within the charging statement, so set out within section six of the, the charging statement. And then kind of following on from that, is there any um, ongoing cost to use the APIs? So there are uh, usage charges for EES APIs um, and the, the charges are for TPIs, uh, for TPI service providers, again, kind of as, as detailed on the slide there. Um, and then the, the, the GES API usage charges, they are then set out again in the charging statement. So I think if people are interested in understanding what, what costs there are either to set up or to access ongoing costs, um, it is then uh, access the uh, charging statement. And again, on the slide there, we have included the link to into that. My, my interpretation there and the fact they're not mentioned is that there isn't a cost for rec parties, is that right? That's right. Yeah, it specifically calls out though those exceptions. So there, is, there isn't. If it's not called out there, then there is no uh, kind of cost for for those. Uh, final couple of questions that we've got. So, is there a data limit on the use of the APIs? Um, so, the API search limits are based on the organisation service plan. So, the charging statement sets out the the usage plans that are available to EES users. Um, and there is a uh, API uh, usage limit uh, for monthly searches um, and that is set out at a, a, an organisational level. Um, and what we've just called out uh, within the, the answer there is those specific sections of the, the charging statement that, that refers to um, the, the um, elements of the, the data limit and any charges where um, those um, limits have been exceeded. So for both ES and um, GES, um, if those limits are exceeded, there are, are those charges within the, the charging statement. And then the final one, that if you are a rec party and have not used the APIs before, um, are they already included in the contract? So kind of pull this covers in uh, the point that costs for the rec parties are covered, uh, recovered in accordance with the charging statement methodology, but there are no specific usage based charges. Um, and what I would say is if you are a rec party and you wish to access the GES or the ES APIs, um, contact um, uh, the code manager, so your operational account manager, or, or through to inquiries, so to the service desk or the inquiries mailbox. Fantastic. Thank you, Rep. And, and just like that, we, we come over to um, bang on time. Uh, it's now 15.30. Um, I had a question asked about whether we'd share the Q&A from today also uh, after the session. Uh, and just so you're aware that we are updating a rec version three frequently asked questions log, which appears on the release management of uh, the release information page on the portal. And when I push out the slides and the and the recording of this, we'll make sure we link through to, to that as well. So you can have a log of all these questions that are being asked at these events and the answers provided to them. It would be Incredibly helpful if you could provide some from feedback from today's session. I appreciate we've answered almost all the questions. We haven't quite managed to hit them all, but we will attempt to make sure they're all answered in the, in the wrap up as well. Um, and, and, and hopefully you uh, um, you recognise that um, while the focus of this session was meant to be on, as I said, access and access to the rail, we're trying to be as um, as helpful as possible with the people we got around the table and answering your questions so you've got the information sooner rather than later. But if you think we could have done anything better or differently, um, or you think we did anything very well, we'd, we'd love to hear about it so we can build it into our continuous improvement plan. But um, I'm sure you've all got better places to be. Um, so with no further ado, we'll wrap up this session. I look forward to sharing the recording um, with you uh, over the course of the next few days. I thank you very much to the speakers today, those who have contributed to answering questions as well uh, through, through the panel, and all of you who have attended and asked us questions as we've gone through the event today. We do have another couple of Rec version 3 webinars planned over the, the course of the next couple of weeks, but we're all now 
all eyes on on go live um, ready for CSS readiness in on the 18th of July and there'll be some uh, helpful wash up sessions after go live as well with the code manager where you can drop in and ask questions in the sort of a hyper care period after go live and we'll share information about those with you shortly. But thank you again. Um, I'll draw this event to a close and say thank you very much for your time and speak to you all very soon.